The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This spring break, I decided to try something a little bit new and go on a backpacking trip. We'll see how it goes. Unless volunteers maintain the trails, trails get closed. We knew that it would be a perfect resort development with a golf course, and we just couldn't stand the thought of that. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. My name is Emily Lozano, and I'm 20 years old, and I've always loved the outdoors. Ever since I was young, my family would take me to different Texas state parks. We'd tent camp, and we'd get all we need out of the car. So this spring break, I decided to try something a little bit new and go on a backpacking trip. I'm going to do the Lone Star hiking trail. It's extremely long, some 90-something miles. We'll see how it goes. Okay, I parked my car at the beginning of the trail, and I ended up needing a ride to the end of it so that I could hike the trail in reverse. Hey, how you John doing? John was my Hi, ride. Good to meet you. You ready to get your pack in the car? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And John is the real backpacker. He's done the AT multiple times. We hit it off instantly. Because it's been raining so much, we skip Winter's Bayou and start at Tarkington. There's three things to remember when you're doing your long trail here. First thing is, is um, physical. You can do it. Next part, you gotta feed yourself, so what's your food supplies, your logistics. And finally, every morning you're gonna have to get up and get on the trail and gotta be able to keep doing it day in and day out, okay? He's so sweet. Not what I expected at all. He gives me certain tips about backpacking. Emily, as you see, this is the uh, blazes for the Lone Star Trail. That tells you to go left, as you should go, rather than right down that other road. Definitely will keep you from getting lost. Pointing in the right direction. Correct. All right. Let's Sounds move on. Good. His stories are fantastic. First AT trip, 1995. I'm a neophyte backpacker. Didn't know anything. He really, really cared. He really wanted to make sure I was going to be OK as soon as he left. Good morning. Oh, good morning. How are you doing? Next is Alan. Alan is super <laughs> sweet. I don't know where we're going. <laughs> you don't know where you're going? I don't oh, know. We're going to get lost. And he was so pleasant, and he talked about the organization. The Lone Star Trail is 98.6 miles long, and then we have about another 35 miles of other loops. And it's all done by volunteers? All done by volunteers. Uh, we have several nonprofit organizations, principal one being the Lone Star High Control Club. So what is your part in that? I help coordinate uh, trail stewards, and trail stewards might involve adopting a mile or two miles of the hiking trail to help maintain it. Here's a beaver dam right here. That's a beaver dam? That's a beaver dam right here. Yeah. I don't think they would like me knocking on their doors too much. So why do you do it? Unless volunteers maintain the trails, trails get closed. We get to our campsite, and he heads out, and he goes Hello. home. I'm tired, and I definitely feel it. Cilantro lime with black. Up next is the Magnolia section, which has the massive obstacle of crossing the San Jacinto River. Thankfully, I don't have to do it alone. 
Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Dave. Dave looks Good like a you. ranger How'd straight like from this? Jurassic oh, Park. <laughs> I've never crossed a river, so I'm so anxious. Okay, Emily, so there's an option for you here. That's a way to get across without getting wet, as long as you don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cross a tree that's slippery with a pack. All right. Let's, let's wade. Let's go wade. Okay. Now come come upstream. Come this way. Yeah. Come. This way. That's your target. Head for that branch. How deep is this? The deepest part is right in front of that other stick. That was the hard part. I make it across safely. I am so grateful that Dave was there. I don't think I could have done it by myself. Honestly, it was so much more fun having him there. I'm glad I'm not carrying your pack today. Yeah, there's quite a bit more sag with your pack on there, look. <laughs> Dave is nice enough to give me a lift to the next trailhead, which saves me a whole lot of walking, and I could not be happier. And Dave brings me next to the Big Wood section. Then he heads off. Hi. I've begun to notice a blister and I'm praying that it doesn't get worse. On top of being alone, the day seems to stretch a little bit longer. I have so much time alone with my thoughts. Every mile feels a little bit longer. I enjoyed being by myself and I enjoyed the second to kind of daydream a little bit. But I almost got a little bit lonely. I am getting a little lonely. Walking down the road is miserable. I don't like the road because it is gravelly and it's hot and there's no shade. And I just wanted to take a break. There wasn't even a good spot to break. And it's straight. It makes it feel like it's forever. So I just kept walking. Off to my right, I see a sign and it's clearly marked. And as soon as I hit the shade, I plop down on a log and gobble up a granola bar and it's fantastic. Just past the trailhead is this primitive campsite. My blister is massive. Honestly, I wanna cry a little bit. Not feeling like I'm ready to do the over half of the trail that's still left to go. So in the mailbox is this log of all of the people who have been here before me and all of their encouraging words. It made me feel like a part of it. And it gave me the strength to keep going. Day five, this is the last day before Huntsville State Park. My legs hurt. My thighs are burning. My feet hurt. I run into Candace, who gives me a lift to the next trail section. I started going out on the public hikes, and I just kept coming back. Candace explains a lot of the methods and a lot of the procedures that they go through when volunteering on the trail. It's not created by a machine. 
And a user-created trail is one of the hardest trails to maintain. But not very many people live out here and can actually work on the trail. It's just been turned over to volunteers. We're what she loves is the chance to give back. Candace is most definitely a trail angel. She absolutely saved me. My feet look terrible. They don't look as bad as they feel, but they almost look as bad as they feel. And I'm just so ready to see my family. And I don't want to have to hike all of that in the morning. It's midday, still a whole lot of sun left. Oh goodness. If I hike more today, it'll be less tomorrow. Let's do that. I crank out another section of trail. Find a nice patch of trees. <laughs> Set up my hammock and pass out. Day six. It's already a good day and it hasn't even started. I see a tiny little Honda Civic. I know that car. It has my dad and my sister and my little baby brother. They drove all this way to spend the day with me. We go to Huntsville State Park and they have showers in Huntsville State Park. And my sister brought fruit salad. And I'm not hiking. And it's so great. Amanda's coming with me on the next three days, and I'm so excited. OK, so what'd you bring? OK, I have a jacket. That's good. You can keep that. Socks. Ooh, nice socks. OK. Pants. OK, that's good. Then I have this. Today. That's the same sleeping bag I have. Really? OK, and then I have a lot of snacks, which I don't think I need this much. No, I <laughs> ate, like, I ate through a whole bag of snacks. We built a campfire, and I get to catch up with her. And I'm so happy that I get to share this with her. Next morning, I'm excited, and Amanda's excited, which just makes me more excited. I feel light. It feels like day one all over again. I'm not doing it alone anymore. And this is someone at my experience level. And this is someone my age who gets it. You go into the big <laughs> hot pole. Actually, I want you in front of me so that if it's you slip. Slippery. Oh, it's not slippery. I was expecting it to be worse. The fact that Amanda was so chipper and so cheerful, it helped me get over the fact that my foot hurt. It helped me get over the fact that my muscles were sore and that my back hurt. Amanda being so positive just made it so easy for me to say, okay, let's do it. One more day. Closing. Amanda's ready to be done. I'm ready to be done. And then we come up on stubble field, and it's such a relief. I don't have to admit to my sister that I don't know what I'm doing, even though I'm pretty sure she knows that I don't know what I'm doing. And that's okay. <laughs> It feels like the end is near. Like you can taste it, like you're so close. See the bubbles? Super eerie almost with this fog hanging.
and this was one of our longest days. We did so many miles. I was struggling with the nine mile days and the 13 mile days, and then we did a 15. how it happened. I really like this and I like backpacking. I probably wouldn't be doing half as much if I wasn't here with you. Without you, I was doing half the mileage we did. <laughs> I don't know how you did it because I'm super duper tired right now. That's just wanting it. And we just did 15 miles in yeah. one day. 15 miles, so you got it, boo. This is it. This is the end. I'm so sad because it's ending, but more than anything, I'm excited. Every step and you're closer. Walk faster. Walk faster. Walk faster. <laughs> Every trail maker feels like a victory in itself. Oh, I one more mile. That's my car. I know that license plate number. I know the dirt on that tire. I know that dent. I did that dent. Oh, I'm coming for it. We made it. We made it. I need to take this off right now. And then Amanda and I go to a real restaurant and I order real food. No mushy bag food. Okay, yeah. What was your favorite part? My favorite part was probably Huntsville State Park. Just taking the day off and relaxing. It helped me enjoy the trail even more afterwards. And your worst part? My worst part was my pinky toe grown a toe. <laughs> and what was the hardest thing of it? The hardest thing was probably what just getting up and starting. What made you keep going? We were in the middle of the woods. There wasn't an option. <laughs> That's yeah. True. I did it. I finished it. And my blister healed and my toe is fine. I feel so accomplished and I feel so blessed that these volunteers are out there because without them, this trail would be closed. It was such a great spring break and great in ways I wouldn't have expected it to be. And I'm so glad I went. Our ranch is in southeastern Gillespie County. Three Mile Creek Ranch. It's uh, 685 acres. The ranch is a beautiful example of what a well-managed piece of land looks like. And it wasn't always that way. This area is a traditionally heavily grazed area. We just need one more rain. <laughs> you always say that. When the Bergmans acquired the land a little over 20 years ago, it was wall-to-wall -wall cedar and not very much grass. So they began removing juniper strategically. Not just clear-cutting everything, but very carefully, and then immediately would throw native grass seed out. We went to NRCS and met Thomas Hammer. Up until that point, we knew nothing about native grass, and it's easy to fall in love. This is Lenheimer Muley. Puts down a great root system. It's fabulous for uh, erosion control. And that along with uh, bushy blue stems is a really good sign. After we began clearing the cedar, we could see the grass be established. The impact was so obvious and so immediate. Uh, more springs, creek flow. It was incredible incredibly gratifying. All these dogwoods have sprouted up. That became our goal. We wanted it to look like it looked before people got here. We run cows and we use them as a tool, but that's all. We cross fenced and rotate them. When it quits raining, we start selling. 
you got good things happening here, no doubt about it. And they never stop trying to learn maybe and to improve on what they're doing and how to go about it. With electric fencing. You know, I said, I think you have more deer than you realize. Now they notice the browse lines, the hedging and those things. They don't claim to know all the answers. So they go and they find people that do know the answers. If the habitat looks good, and that means the number's good. Jeff was one of our hunters out here. They prefer the weeds. He's a professor at Carleton University. Right. The Bergmans let me bring students out here. We do a little bit of work, and in turn, I try to give them a little bit of data. It is so much fun having them out here. It's worked out well for everybody. <laughs> Each of you get one side of the vehicle and start sweeping. Brought a few students out here to work on a deer survey. It gives us a little idea what the post-season deer population is and see if we actually did any good during the honey season lowering the population. You see some eyes back in this tree right there. We're really trying to get our deer numbers down. We had our first youth hunt last year and that was a great time. The Texas Youth Hunting Program was a good opportunity for them to remove excess numbers of deer. It went really, really well, so we're going to continue doing that. It's a beautiful plant. These are all larger than you would normally see to keep the deer from... One of the things that Kim and Pam have done is they have erected cages, or we call them exclosures, around some of the plants that have become quite uncommon in the hill country because of the overabundant deer population. It's the rusty black hawk. Young cherry trees, young red buds, young sumac, and so they're giving those plants a jump start. We missed one over here. Our kids have worked on it. We used to go out there and lock cedar for days at a time. It has just made our family so close to have shared that goal. After we had done 20 years of work on our place, we knew that it would be a perfect resort development with a golf course, and we just couldn't stand the thought of that. That ranch becomes part of your family. You've got so much time invested in it, you just can't see it carved up. In cooperation, partnership with the Hill Country Land Trust, the Bergmans made the ultimate conservation commitment. We placed a conservation easement on it, so it will never be developed. They're doing their part of being the stewards and the long-term caretakers of this land, and uh, I take my hat off to them. We're grateful every day to be here and be able to enjoy it and continue working on it. Catch the last hour of daylight, just drive around the ranch. We do that quite often. And it's a story everywhere you look. This is where we overlook our uh, hard work, I think, or a good portion of it. What oh, is pretty, isn't it? Yes. It never gets old. It's what we do and what we love, and we are so happy we get to do it. It's absolute paradise.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels. Over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.